All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Carlson Cards podcast. We have a very fun episode here today, and I'm going to just go out and say it. I think our guest today has the most underrated page on Instagram. It's high praise there, maybe. I know there's a lot of good pages, but like legitimately the amount of work that Greg puts into his page and just the uniqueness and quality across the board. If you guys haven't seen his page and you like this episode, you have to go check him out. Even go check it out before this episode as we're pulling this up. So you kind of get some context and some of the cards and, um, you know, the art that Greg does here. So Greg, I just want to thank you for hopping on. I just want to ask, how's everything going? How's your week been so far? Yeah, man, everything's been good. Um, just really excited to have a little break here to talk about cards. Um, my wife just got a kitten, so I was up all night last night with that. So, you know, we're just uh, always good to talk about cards and just get into it. What's uh, being up all night with a kitten entail? You're like breastfeeding it or something yourself? <laughs> yeah sometimes you never know how that goes but yeah. um they uh i don't know they're just awake all the time they're, they sleep for like 10 minutes wake up for 10 minutes and you know it is what it is but uh yeah. it's it sounds cute, like a so child it sounds like a baby yeah so exactly like they're used yeah. to that by now yeah yeah a little bit no she's getting the uh, the top teeth right now so last night was like midnight we're up she's screaming it's like okay let's just read this touch and feel book like and that works <laughs> and then i pull out some she loves for instance like for some reason pokemon cards she like i did not try to push cards on her and all but my oh, brother yeah. was visiting last week and then kind of got me into pokemon a little bit again i'm like oh where's this going but um so i was showing her some of the hollows and stuff and she's like ah, she loves them so i don't know that'll be it's good good taste you're starting early yeah yeah pretty much and then hopefully transition that to sports just like i did i you know i just the idea of a daughter being super savvy with sports just appeals to me i just think that's a, such an impressive thing like it's just, just cool put that just put that brady select in her crib and uh, she'll get used to it yeah, yeah. Well, she'll suck on it. That's the problem. And I don't know about those. I don't know if those Beckett slabs are waterproof. We'll have to check. Maybe I'll test. Yeah, yeah. I have to press Doctor Beckett and see what he says. Awesome. I appreciate you hopping on here, Greg. Like I said, um, you know, just kind of dive in here a little bit. So again, the way I first found your page, I don't know how I stumbled on it, right? But she said the most incredible selection of cards, but then also like tying in, um, you know, art to it. Like when I see your page, it's a lot of things where it's like, okay, take the card. Now let's expand this to a full image. And what would that look like if the card was right. featured in the image? Um, I'd love you to talk about like the history of your page and interest here with art, you know, what kind of fueled that and um, anything you want to share here. I'd really interested in hearing. Yeah. So I was always like a um, artistic person. I always used to draw, sketch, do some like graphic work here and there. Um, and then about, I think it was like 2018 timeframe when I started my page on Instagram. Um, and I had originally just started posting pictures and um I don't know. I, I guess something in me was like, yeah, you know, this isn't quite doing it justice to some of these cards. You know what I mean? It, like they're they're great, but card, some cards are really hard to photograph. You know what I mean? So either the lighting or whatever. Um, and so I kind of just did it as like a way to try to be unique, try to differentiate my page a little bit. Um, you know, some people take those pictures with their cards. You see like their face kind of like shining back in the reflection, you know? So yeah, I was trying to avoid some of that stuff. So just the best that I could to try to make it as uh aesthetically pleasing and draw people in uh, that's really what the, the goal was that's awesome and then um so you said some interest in art any prior like hobbies or experiences that kind of helped you know to have such a i'd say quality page like everything just looks like you're a professional so i'm just curious if you have any experiences like, uh that. yeah i mean not really i i do some stuff on the side like kind of like ad hoc work for you know some people uh, i've done stuff for like magazines some stuff for like um stuff like that but like nothing nothing like crazy you know just kind of just all kind of just side stuff um it was never really a primary thing it's always kind of just been there as like a sidecar um but i've i've really enjoyed it um it really allows me to get into the cards i kind of study them probably more than i would otherwise you know i really get to look at it kind of um see how you know i want to go about designing it um and uh and yeah i really just wanted to get these cards environments so to speak that, that kind of um extended the beautiful art they already had um so i, I focus mostly on 90s stuff so it's a lot of 90s stuff it's mostly basketball right now um i've toyed with maybe you know I, I do collect some baseball and some football so i've toyed with maybe doing some of that too so maybe uh some of the listeners can give me some feedback on their thoughts on that yeah no i would love football i think that'd be incredible super cool i don't know anyone doing something like that so i think it's really really cool um it, it would tie well because i had a recent foray into uh J jake Plummer, so i've started collecting jake Plummer a little bit so maybe maybe i'll start introducing some of that to the page yeah that'd be cool 
Um, so I was going to ask, so the, the 90s interest there and specifically basketball, um, where did that come from? Grow up with this as a kid or you kind of got into it later in life? Just curious how that came Um out. Yeah, so I'm probably a little bit younger than most um, most uh, 90s collectors. I think most are probably, you know, they were hitting their heyday in like that 12, 13-year-old time frame in like the late 90s. I was probably only like, you know, six or seven. And so I'm not really there buying metal boxes and skybox premium, you know. I was more, you know, buying bazooka and uh, uh, upper deck boxes. You know what I mean? My, after school, my mom would drop us off and, uh, at Target or Walmart, and I, I would get like a nine dollar blaster. That's what I would get. Um, but then I, I think I think some of this art stuff, some of just like the '90s culture, which I kind of grew up with, it's so prevalent in a lot of the artistic designs. Um, a lot of that, I don't know, it's just that boombastic, onomatopoeia, boom slam, jam, all that. You know, it's really apparent bold colors bold typography um bold as far as card technology the lenticulars the the refractor the um the embossing all that stuff it really went to the nth degree um there's like kind of like a mini renaissance uh for um for cards at the time and so i think that that because it was so elevated in so many areas i think that's why you know it, it kind of makes a good segue for the stuff I like to collect as well as stuff I like to portray on the page with the artwork. So in terms of then the collecting side of things, I know you had said, you know, five, six years old at that time, you were opening boxes and that sort of thing. Did you collect all the way through then now to your, I'm guessing sounds like then in your thirties, right? Or low thirties. Yeah. Have you collected all the way through or you kind of got back into it? Um, so I probably collected for, um, I guess I started early on with my uncle would buy, give us like baseball cards. That's all I really had was, was baseball 89, 90 tops. Um, and so I probably collected for until I was about like 12, 13. I still kind of collected here and there all the way through, but it was more like sporadic, maybe a year off here. Um, I would still look at the stuff, you know, I, I was out enjoy it, but I wasn't really active. Um, and then probably around like 2016 ish is when I kind of got back into it more <laughs> full time, I guess my, um, my brother's uh, father-in-law had bought a jersey on eBay and he was telling me about it. And I was like, eBay, I remember eBay. And I used to, I mean, to us card collectors, eBay is literally just a card place. You know what I mean? There, there's no other use for eBay. It's just cards. And so um, I actually got, I was actually on eBay pretty early. So even when I was like younger, when I was like nine or 10, I had an eBay account. And um, I remember going to the bank and my dad set up an account for me and I had a debit card. I connected it, I had like a hundred bucks in there and I would just buy I'd buy Kobe cards on, on eBay, like 2000, like 2001, 2002 time frame. So, um, you know, long history with eBay and, but yeah, I guess over the years I've had like a, um, little bit of a hiatus here and there, but always kind of would have it available to like look at and, and, you know, at least enjoy them. I'm curious, any memorable purchases there as a kid on eBay when you have the kind of a free for all there? Yeah. So there was one, I remember it was like 13 bucks and, um, there's a Kobe, uh, collector's, um, uh, collector's choice rookie. And it has, it's like a trip deck, almost like the, um, the, uh, the 1980, um, bird magic and, um, Irving. It's kind of like that, but it's Kobe, Kevin Garnett and Jermaine O'Neal. And, uh, I bought that and it was, it was autographed by all three. Um, it came with one of those, like, you know, uh, shoddy, um, COE. So I still don't know to this day if it's, if it's real or not, but I keep it and maybe I'll get it authenticated or hopefully authenticated one day, but. Uh, that was one of my first purchases. I remember that pretty vividly. That I'm, I'm sure as a kid, you didn't never doubted the authenticity. You were like, "This thing's real." Tell all the no, friends and like even like to that. this day, I'm like, I don't even know who was like faking Jermaine O'Neal autographs back in like 2001. So I'm like, part of me thinks it's like, okay, maybe it is legit. You know what I mean? So I, I don't know. We'll have to get that uh, authenticated. No, for sure. Um, so one of the questions I kind of asked you was your favorite underappreciated sets. Again, maybe, you know, whether it's visual, visuals, design, you know, collectability, that sort of thing. And you gave me a couple of photos. So I was going to share that uh, if you don't mind. Um, I was wondering if you just talk about the sets we have shown here and then if there was any others that you want to touch on. And then just keeping in mind that not everyone will have the visuals. So if you want to just, you know, describe what you're seeing, that'd be great as well. Sure. Yeah, maybe hop to the second pick first and I'll, I'll jump in there. Sure. Um, yeah, so this is one of my favorite sets of all time. I think from an aesthetic perspective, from an art perspective, perspective, I love um, layered cards. And what I mean by that is like layering of technologies. So if it has um, die cutting, embossing, refractor, acetate, lenticular, um, really any of these technologies, if you have multiple of those, I really like that concept. And so um, 
97, 98, and 899, there was uh, Top Stadium Club did these triumvirate sets. And they were just, to me, as extremely aesthetically pleasing. Um, the first time I saw them, this was probably like back in um, 2017, I really wanted to grab all the Kobe's. So here's a picture of, of all of them. The, the first two, the top two rows are the um, are the alum, are the triumvirates, and the, the number three, the third row is also a triumvirate in you know the way it's structured, but it's not um, it's not from the uh, um, the same type of set as the first two. So I guess I'll kind of describe what these are. And so the way the set was designed was that there are three levels, I guess, to each card. Uh, the first uh, um, column you see there. Those are the triumvirate, and those are the the luminous parallel. So, and it's get kind of kind of cagey because each year and each series, um, they weren't always the same. But for for these series, uh, for Kobe, uh, the first ones here are um, the luminous parallel, which kind of has like a, a chrome finish, so it's a little bit chrome and die cut. Um, the next two there in the next column are the the luminescent uh, parallel, and those have like a refractor finish along with the die cut. And then the third ones are like full acetate cards, dual side refractor uh, with the die cut. And on top of that, you know, they're called triumvirants. So um, there's three pieces to each. So there's a, a, a two more pieces to each of these that would fit together. And so for series one, I'm pretty sure it was all like the, the Lakers team set. So it was like Shaq, Kobe and like Eddie Jones, I think. And then for series two, um, it was all about the accolades. So it was like who was the top three for scoring or points per game or something like that. Um, but I always thought these were just extremely, extremely beautiful. Um, and they're actually, they're actually pretty rare too. I think some of the, the pack odds, um, if they calculate these on the first two, at least were about one in every 4,608 packs, uh, to pull a particular player. So, you know, it's one of those ones that it kind of gets, you know, it's not numbered, so it doesn't really get as much, uh, notoriety, but, uh, from an aesthetic perspective, I think they're some of the best cards out there. I'd say it's shocking to me. I, I have actually never seen these, but I've seen the, that Jordan that we will hover over and go back to. I've seen that a ton, but for some reason, not this Kobe. Any reason you think that is? Just Jordan's like a little yeah. more rare, well known. That that sets a little more well known. For yeah, I mean, like like most uh, you know '90s sets that Jordan's in, he kind of you know reigns supreme. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I think I think once you, it's one of those things where um, if you see one, you'll kind of start seeing them more and more. But uh, I think recency the, bias or whatever that is. I don't know. What yeah, that is. exactly. Yeah. Um, I think it's like Bader Meinhof, I think it's called. Yeah. Um, but these these ones here, I think the print run on some of these, especially on the Illuminator, I think there's only about 152, I think, of those. Uh, I think it's about double for the Luminescent. And then I think it's about maybe um, four times for the Luminous. Um, so I'm not sure the exact pack odds, I mean, the exact uh, print runs on those. Um, I've seen some forms that kind of reverse engineered, you know, the pack odds and stuff, but that, that's roughly where I think the print run falls. That's incredible. I love like, you know, and to your point too, obviously being a fan of visuals and art, um, it's really interesting hearing your perspective too on like what makes, you know, the the combination of different, you know, design choices here. Like, right, you know, like you said, die cuts, there's acetates, there's refractors. I mean, what I love about the 90s, and again, don't collect an absurd amount of it myself, but I just love the the design freedom they had, you know, the creativity, the just, just yeah. going for it. I mean, I don't know about you, but it feels like nowadays it's a little less of that. Um, maybe just because the ideas are gone, maybe there's no room for more innovation, but I would argue there probably is. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. If you look at these compared to like yeah. modern cards, what's your perspective there? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've spoken this a few times on like my, my stories and stuff as I think that, I don't know, it's like anything else. It's when there's not a ton of competition, you know, stuff gets lazy. And I think, I think we've seen some of that. Um, which was so great in, in the 90s was that you had so many manufacturers and they were all creating different things at a time. So you had, you had a ton of manufacturers at a time when collecting, especially basketball, wasn't really at an all time high. So you have this this need to like want to please the public and you have multiple parties trying to do so. And so you kind of had to pull out all the stops and they really did. Um, there's like there's a few sets. Uh, what comes is Flare Showcase Wave to the Future. I think it's uh, 98, 99, maybe. Um, but it was literally a small little bubble card and there's actually liquid inside the card and you can like squeeze it and it kind of like moves around like an air bubble will kind of like float or it, it's just a really, some people hate them. It's not really a big set just because it's like, um, there's really no major players in the set. It's all rookies from like a bad class. And, um, you know, so that happens sometimes, 
but it's just a, you can probably get them for like five to 20 bucks on, on eBay, but they're just really cool to play with. It's one of those, those interactive cards. Like you want to kind of like touch it and, you know, um, play with it. If that, that makes sense. Now, a couple more come to mind too, isn't there that uh, like Kobe's in this set, I think is it fast track or something where it's literally like fur on the card. You know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah. There's is a few sets. Track? The fast track has like the, the felt um, on the, the yep. black lettering and then the, um, Ultrability Superstar is is pretty similar in that the Superstar has the felt as well. And a lot of people don't even know that to this day. There's some big collector who I saw and uh, someone was telling him and he was like, oh, I never even knew that because either the cards are always slabbed up. And so yep. you don't take the time to take them out and look at them and, and touch them. Um, but, you know, that's like the Noise Boys. Uh, the Noise Boys is a really cool um, insert set, but that that's like a full lenticular, um, like bendable card. You can like roll it in a little little tube if you want to. Um, but is that what uh, lenticular yeah. mean? I actually didn't know the def. I've heard it used a lot. I never knew the full definition of that word. So that's it's so, like it's bendable, it's flexible. You can play with so, it. Yeah. No, so lenticular, actually, in my understanding, is really just um, like that has like a three D effect. The way okay. lenticular, as far as how light interfaces with the card. Ah, okay. So you see those a lot on the warp text. If they're they're in some football sets. If you have seen them, um, um, like goal to go or um, Atlanta attitude. Um, those have like the warp tech that's lenticular the um noise boys is lenticular there's a few different lenticular type styles but um i've always those liked cards, that those cards feel funny too right it's like that texture of like am i yeah. wrong i could be wrong here but it's like i always think of you know the uh school lunch boxes with the holographic art on the side yes, that yes texture. Exactly. that's like a pet peeve i don't know if that's like a core memory for anybody but i'd always scratch those and it just like like my neck just shivers just disgusting. <laughs> it, it, it is kind of like that it's almost like um Remember, like when you covered your books in school, that yep. like contact paper. It's yeah. it's almost like it's almost like yeah. that a little bit. Um, but yeah, I love those. Some people don't like them, but I, I really like the lenticular stuff. Well, and that's a cool topic. I mean, just interesting thought there that you you know um, I haven't given much thought to, but it's one of the drawbacks of constant grading, especially when the price of these cards get so high and the ones that you see are a Jordan or a Kobe and they're always slab. It's like you never get the chance to feel them or touch them. Which is so interesting to me. It's a concept I never hear anyone talk about, but that, especially in the '90s, here, like that's super interesting. Yeah, I mean, quite frankly, like I understand the purpose of grading. I like grading some stuff. Other stuff, though, I really, I, it just feels wrong. Like there's like the um, exclamation point set from '98, '99, Flare Ultra, and it's like a, a sleeve, um, and like a card will like pull out of the sleeve. And I think if you grade them, they actually take the insert card out and just grade that. Uh, and then I'm like, then I'm like, Oh, well the other part of the card just kind of what, like sits off to the side on like the bench. Like, I, I don't know. It's just a weird thing for me to, to divorce those, those two pieces. And even like the, um, uh, the silky smooth, I don't know if you've ever seen a, a silky smooth. No, I haven't it has seen like that the, one. Um, it's almost like a booklet card and the front is like a, um, it's like an etched, not etched. Oh, um, like you can see through it, but it's also kind of like, yeah, it's like, it's like a die cut net that flaps yeah. over the front. And I've seen those graded like four different ways. Some people cut the net off. Uh, some people close it and it's graded like that. I've seen them open and graded. Um, and I don't know. It just, to me, that's a card that I just prefer raw. I'd rather have it raw. Yeah. I want to keep it. I want to open it sometimes just to know that I can. And, uh, you know, um, I don't I know. That, that's I've talked about that before. Uh, that's like a big yeah. kind of like pet peeve of mine mm -hmm. is these cards that are like meant to be interacted with and, there's some that have like a, um, it's escaping me. The name's escaping me right now, but there's one and it, it kind of folds out. And like, there's like a picture in the background and has a little, like almost like a little magnifying glass to like, look, Jordan's in the set. Kobe's in the set. And, um, you can't, you can't do it if it's like tucked away or, or slapped up. And that always kind of bothered me. One other thing with that, um, you know, it's kind of funny. It's like, when did we turn into, have you ever seen 40 year old virgin with Steve Carell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like we've turned into those guys. Not not you, I'm saying, but like, you know, the general public, <laughs> we've turned into those guys that have the, you know, our, our action figure collection. They never take them out and play with them. It's kind, yeah. of, it's kind of funny. It just reminds me of that as you were talking there. Well, it's funny. Even when I started collecting, like I I was like, you know what? Because of that, it's like I'm going to get one card. I'm going to get one graded and one ungraded. And I realized how impossible that was. And I was just like, it was like too, too much fun for like this duplicates of cards. And I was like, I can't do this. This isn't worth it. Um, but it was kind of all leaning into that idea of like, I, I want to be able to, I don't know, quote unquote, interact with it. And the other part was, okay, I understand, you know, you know, keeping it nice and, you know, slapping it up and, but, um, I don't know. I don't know. So then there's one other set here with triumvirate that, uh, we were going to touch on. I'd love you to talk on about this one. Again, a really cool set. I think it sounds, 
from my knowledge, it's very similar to what you just talked about with Kobe, but I'd love to hear like the differences here and especially talk about the design. Yeah, so this is from uh, 1996, 1997 Stadium Club. Uh, this is uh, Series 1. And this is just, I brought this up because this is just an uncut one. So this is like, this normally would be cut along like between the three players. Uh, for this series, it was like, looked like basketball, like the wood planks of a basketball court. Like it would kind of like stick out in some areas and not others. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just thought this would be helpful for the visual of, of what those triumvirate sets look like. Uh, when they're to finally put together. I think people sometimes, they graze over the name of like triumvirate and don't even think, oh wait, there's actually three pieces that are kind of meant to be put together. So I think this illustrated that well, but uh, this was the Jordan Bowles uh, team set. Um, so that from series one in 96, 97. Where, um, where does one get an uncut sheet here like this? Is this, I mean, just classic story where the, of the uncut sheets in the nineties or is this some weird unique case with this one? I don't know. These are interesting in that there's actually uh, I feel like a decent amount of these out there. Like you can go on, you can go on eBay right now and find uncut sheets of this. Uh, this is actually where I pulled this picture. It was eBay. So there, there's like, there's like, um, I don't know. There's probably like 15 to 20 at any given, any given time. Some people like them for collecting projects, especially if like a bowls collector to get like, try to get autographs of all three players. Um, I saw one guy on, on Instagram the other day. He's a Ewing collector. He just grabbed one to do the same thing for, you know, and that, that's kind of cool, I guess. Um, but then you have the issue of, I don't know if people are, you know, cutting them up and all that stuff, but, um, they're kind of cool as like a, um, side collection kind of like, um, promo kind of thing. At least, you know, this one would be hard to cut up. I couldn't even imagine trying to maybe oh, yeah. get a damper or yeah. something like a crinkle cut, like you cut it just perfect, but <laughs> there's too complex of a design for this one. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. As, as someone takes a pair of scissors, cuts them right between the players, you can say, ah, that doesn't look right. <laughs> well, it actually very interesting about this set. I actually have a few basketball ones. And I think Naz actually posted a few on his uh, page uh, probably about a few months ago. But for some reason, I don't know if it was as they were transitioning from basketball to baseball on these, I actually have a basketball of uh, Tom Gugliotta and it's die cut in with the baseball die cut. So it has like the glove die cut on like a basketball card so again i don't know what the process was there if it was like the last um uh the last this was the first basketball set after they got done die cutting the baseball and something happened you know something along those lines um but there's all weird kind of quirks out there and and products and cards and one-offs and um i don't know I, I as a collector i kind of find some of that stuff interesting um so you know i'll keep a few of those in my collection just as little little cool stories to sell for sure. Were there any other sets you want to talk, touch on here for like underrated or underappreciated stuff that you liked before we switch to the next? Um, yeah, I guess I, I like uh, a lot of the stuff I like, you know, I love, you know, PMG's credentials, rubies, all those sets. Um, there's some that sets that fly under the radar, in my opinion, and maybe for good reason, maybe not for good reason. Um, and one set was the 99, 2000 hoops, build your own card set. And this set has always fascinated me. I like sets where it's not completely transparent. Like all the information of the set isn't necessarily out there. And so it kind of leaves collectors to um, try to piece together the puzzle on what was the story with this set? Why are some of the print runs seem, why there's so many more cards of one player than another player? And so I'll kind of maybe give a brief description of the set just so uh, everyone can kind of understand. So um, it was actually a redemption set in 99, 2000, where uh, in a pack, you would pull a little booklet and inside the booklet, if you opened it up, there would be like a selection process where there were three fronts and three backs to a particular card. And you could say, okay, I, I want the, I, I pulled the Grant Hill Redemption. I want the, this front with this back. And you would mail it back in with $10 and they would send you the final card. And it was, they were numbered to 250. Um, but what happened was there was a lot of, um, you had Vince Carter in the set he was, he was a rookie the year prior. Um, so, you know, him coming into the league was, uh, he, he was obviously the big shot. So a lot of his cards are out there. You have other players like Van Horn, Keith Van Horn, who, you know, didn't have a strong of a collector base. And so there are just way fewer Keith Van Horns on the market and you really don't find them too often. Um, I know a guy who actually is doing the entire run. So there's, there's, uh, nine cards, so three fronts, three backs, nine cards per player, 10 cards, 90 cards total. Um, he has 78 out of the 90, and of the ones he's missing, seven of them are Keith Van Horn. Um, 
and uh, which makes sense. And so I guess a lot of collectors who do like this set, do collect this set, the question is, you know, what, what does the number to 250 mean? If they were redemptions, were all of them at some point released? If not, then it seems like, well, the actual print run on this must be much lower. Someone could, is it actually 75? I don't know. Um, so that was, you know, one thing I liked about this set. And so I actually started a side project where I would, whether on eBay or social media, anybody who had one of these cards from this set, I would take a picture of the front and back, like screenshot it and just save it in an album. And I tried to find any like inconsistencies or things that um, might line up or not line up to make sense of, okay, what, what are what's some further information about this set? Um, so I guess the first question that came to my mind was out of the 250 serial numbering, it's like, what, what does that actually mean? Were, were all these released? Was it a combination for each front and back? Was it just a 250 backs with whatever front you had on it? So what, what does that 250 mean? And so I guess theoretically, um, if it was per card, there'd be about 2,250 2, cards per player. Um, and uh, I actually did find it like uh, in, in the data I was collecting, I found two Kevin Garnett's with different backs with the same numberings. They're both 31 out of 250, um, which is very interesting, which shows me that there's at least, it's not 250 per player. So there's at least, probably at least three backs or at least 250 for, per back per player. Um, there's really no more information I have right now or that I've found out since then. I think it's probably the um, 2250 is probably the total run per player. As far as where the ones are, like where are all those Keith Van Horns, are they, you know, just in a sheet or in a box and somebody's, you know, that was sold at bankruptcy or something? I don't know. But um, they're definitely, it seems from anecdotal experience, there definitely are less less Keiths on, on the market. Imagine like Santa's workshop here, you have the elves down in the basement and then the one elf has Keith Van Horn and he's just sitting there like, I got nothing to do. Nobody, yeah, nobody's yeah. Gonna, nobody wants to pay $10 <laughs> for this guy. The funniest yeah. part about this whole story though, that I think is that they made you include $10. You get, not only do you pull the redemption, but then you have to give us 10 more dollars, then we will build your card. I just think that's hilarious. Such I know, I know that is kind of funny. I, I always just kind of spit it off like a fact of the story, but once you dive into it, it's like, oh, okay. Yeah, I guess I, but again, that's probably also a deterrent for people not to send it in. It's like, oh, I got this redemption for, you know, um, Jason Williams or AI. It's like, I'm not an AI fan or I'm not a Jason Williams fan. Eh, I'm not going to send it in. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that kind of further adds the lore of the set as to how many are actually out there. Well, and maybe that's what Panini needs to start doing. You know, you pull a Mac Jones auto or something, you got to pay, pay us $100 and then we'll actually get you your redemption instead of making you wait five years. But then nobody <laughs> will pay it and then they don't yeah, have to do exactly. it. And it's a win-win for everybody. Yeah, that, that would be interesting. I, I am like so far removed from the modern redemption game. Same. I hear stories <laughs> on, on podcasts sometimes. I'm like, ah, I don't even care. I don't even, I've never done a redemption. I never really cared to. I, I, I'll just I'll just collect the old ones that I, you know, I, I can. Yeah, buy them for $2. Somebody paid $10 for I'll just pocket this in my binder. We'll keep moving here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. So then uh, next thing that I'm super excited about, just interesting conversation here is backs of cards. You sent me an example of one that um, you want to touch on a little more. So I'd be curious to hear your thoughts here and why you know the backs of cards are important to you here in the 90s. Yeah, I don't know. I guess back when I got into uh, 90s stuff um, in like 2016, I just remember kind of doing some research and, and reading the backs of some of the cards. This is the... Um, Skybox Apex Jam Session from 99, 2000 uh, Skybox Apex. And uh, I don't know, the. I guess my point here is that a lot of the backs of the cards also really um, showed some of the allure and some of the the swag and the, the I don't know, the personality of the 90s. Um, like when I think 90s, especially 90s basketball, I think of, you know, Jordan, Jordan dunking, Kobe or someone dunking, and then everyone's like, Oh my gosh, look at that. And this back of this card, you know, so heavily leans into that. It's like a love letter. It reads like a love letter. Like the last line, like people learned how to program their VCRs because of you, like literally because people were like rewinding and fast forwarding and going back to spots because that was such a cool moment. Mm -hmm. Um, it just gives you that, it just oozes that vibe of just, I don't know that these players were larger than life. Like I got to go back and watch that again. I'm going to watch the highlights over and over. I'm going to record it and do it again and tomorrow night with my, you know what I mean? It, it's, it's just, and so that's why I pointed out because I think sometimes someone was, it's been a topic recently on Instagram of people talking about the backs of cards and how 
you know, now it's, again, I, I don't know. I don't really look at too many modern cards. I only do it when they're kind of like thrust in my face, but they kind of seem to lack a little love in that area. Um, it's like the attention to detail. Like, I just feel like it's something you overlook easily when there's not, like you kind of maybe said that competition or that, you know, like we need to hit, hit, hit on everything here. It's like that's lacking for some reason. Yeah. Like, I don't know if they have a specific person at some of the manufacturers now who is probably crafting the language on the backs of the cards when, you know, there probably is a, is a need for that. If, if players are, if you want people to connect with the cards and the cards can really reinforce some of that nostalgia or reinforce, um, you know, some of the aesthetic about the card. You think you would have someone there trying to put something out that's that's uh, somewhat impressive. No, for sure. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that one. Again, not something I always think of just based on the era I collect. I, I don't pay attention as much, but I feel like the 90s, there's so much variety and, you know, it's just it's just unique. I think yeah, it refractors they're, they're, on the back sometimes, like we talked about too, which is cool. Yeah, there, there's so much. And that's why, you know, when I when I started collecting, I was like, I luckily I was I'm a player collector. And again, I don't know how most people collect now. There, I know there's team collectors, player collectors, um, set collectors. To me, for somebody who wants to get to know a particular era, whether it's me trying to learn like the mid 2000s football or something, the best way that it seems to be is just to find one player and just kind of study their catalog of, of cards. And that way I get, a, I get a, a full palette of, you know, what am I looking at here from what, what's available from sets to inserts to parallels. And then in doing so, I also learn all those sets, learn who else is in those sets, learn what's, what's chased by, learn pack odds, all that stuff. So for, for me, that worked. And I, I think that's probably a good way to approach it. Yeah. It's funny you describe that. That's exactly what I did. Um, when I want to get into football, I just focus one player. And then it's interesting, like how you just said, you kind of get a grasp on what's the grand scheme of cards for this guy. And then you could naturally lean into oh, well, who were his teammates that would be fun to collect or who were, you know, his competition right. that would be fun to collect or in the same sets. That's kind of where I've drifted. Yeah. And I, it's interesting that even in basketball, that's the case. Like, that's pretty cool to me that it kind of transcends sports and eras and that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. And that's why it's nice, too, if you are like mostly football, mostly basketball, mostly baseball, you know, there, there is comparability across sports, too. And so it's not going to be it's not like a one for one. Like the pack odds are sometimes different. You know, the design is slightly different, but um in general, you can kind of understand that, okay, I, I know this is a, a popular set in basketball or baseball. Uh, maybe there's some equivalent in, in the other sports. Oh, that totally makes sense. Apologize if the audience was hearing my dog crying outside the door. My wife just <laughs> left him in here and he just wants to join. He just wants to hang out. Um, no, awesome. I mean, this is super fun. I got to say great conversation so far, Greg. Um, now we're diving into what we'll call your Mount Rushmore of your favorite designs you've created. So this is obviously, if any of you at the beginning of the episode already knew Greg, but if you looked on his Instagram, you would be met with just stunning pieces of art tied to great cards, iconic cards with, you know, again, a flair on like, what if we had the whole Instagram post to work with here instead of just one card. And so I'd love Greg, if you just touch on, um, you know, the cards here, the art, you know, what you put together. I'd just love to hear the story behind some of these. Yeah. So the, um, 97, 98 metal universe championship, precious metal gems, Michael Jordan, number to 50. I mean, this is probably one of the most iconic nineties cards of any player of any set. Um, and really just to give it some more, more texture, kind of putting it in place in Chicago. So you kind of see Lakeshore drive over there. And this is kind of where this card quote unquote, like takes place. Um, so you see the John Hancock building in the back. Um, and, uh, I actually did a collaboration with this with Naz and uh, he was really interesting to talk to because we were messing back and forth. And um, this was like one of his favorite cards. And he actually grew up on, you know, on Lakeshore Drive. So, it, you know, that's why this card also just, you know, it, it has like a, a certain lore and also has that personal influence to some people, especially if you're a Bulls collector from Chicago from the 90s. It doesn't want really to get much better than this. Um, this set was awesome, though. I mean, I'm sure you've seen, the, you know, these in all sports. Um, but, uh yeah, and these were again to go back to redemptions. Uh, these these were really cool. The the first uh, forty five of these were uh, pack inserted, and the last five in the set were actually avail available via redemption. Um, and so, and not only just redemption for the card, but I think I've, I've talked about this with Adam Gray, the real twenty seven guy, and they were actually like golden ticket redemptions, yep. meaning that if you got that redemption you got a full box set of all the PMGs for that sport. 
So, you know, and I think he, he, he did a video when he was talking about um, the, the Jordans that have been found from those last five. And I think, I think four out of the five have been found. And so there's one that's not. And again, I don't know if you cross reference it with other players. I don't know if they have those, but I guess theoretically to my knowledge right now, there could be one redemption box out there that still has the full PMG set from um, 97, 98 Middle Universe Championship. So I know for football, at least, um, this is something that I've heard somebody say is that you know, his first 45 condition is so hit or miss. And if you have actually are able to find one of those last five, they tend to grade the highest simply because they were kept in great shape because they weren't in a pack. Is that consistent across sports? Again, just curious more so because it's just a weird thing you'd never think about, but it makes sense to me how that is. Then. I'm not sure. I'm not sure across sport. Um, I know for, for basketball, I think I've, I've heard that same sentiment that the, the, you know, the end of the production because of, you know, they were in a box and not in some kid's binder um, tend to have better, better quality. Maybe, um, you know, that's more just anecdotal. That's my kind of like two cents on the matter, but yeah, I, I can't tell for sure. No, that totally makes sense. Um, I was curious to on this one, just specifically, I know you did a collab there, like with someone else who this was his card, I'm guessing then. And yeah. You, yeah. So ha has that been something that you pursued quite a bit or something you will in the future? I just think it's a cool idea. I feel like you don't, um, how do you see like a lot of people doing that, but I think it's a cool concept because there's all these cards out there that, you know, maybe you or myself can't go purchase, but you can still, you know, tie to something really interesting and unique, unique here. Yeah. It's, it's been, it's been great. Like I would say about 99% of the cards on my page are mine, but there's some cards I don't own probably will never own. And, but I'd still like to work with them in some capacity. And so it's honestly been great there because in, in a, on Instagram, sometimes there's a lot of, you know, clickbaity type stuff like oh look at this was just pulled and and like i i tend to you know it, it's good to keep a pulse on some of that stuff but it's also good to really just focus on the collector side and so i try to find other collectors who are like the collector's collector and do collabs with them so a lot of player collectors from the 90s i've done collections with um or i've done collaborations with where it's like hey listen this is a great card you know let's kind of do a collaboration post and give me a small write-up i'll do a design and you know there and there it is um, but it's been fun. It's been a great way to kind of connect with other, other collectors, especially from the nineties. And then, uh, you know, it kind of hopefully, le uh, helps to, um, bolster up some of the, the true collector content out there. Yeah, no, I think it does. That's why I started the episode saying in one of the most underrated pages, and I sincerely mean that I think, um, you know, it's just cool seeing someone like yourself, put this much effort and love the cards. Obviously everyone can hear that from talking to you here. And it's just so awesome to see something unique. Cause I feel like we're met with, like you said, same clickbaity stuff that's just not unique. It's the same thing every time. Here's a bounty. Here's this, whatever. I mean, I try to hide it, but it just keeps popping up. You can't get rid of this stuff. It's always yeah, there. I mean, I, I've done collaborations with people on like, you know, $25 cards. And yeah. they're just like, they're just super fun and super layered. They have a bunch of technology on them. So it's really cool to to work with it. And uh, the design kind of like pops out. So I'm like, dude, let's, let's do it. Let's do it up. Awesome. So what's the next card here? Yeah, so this is the 98-99 EX Century uh, Dunkin' Donut, Dunkin' Go Nuts. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure most people, this is kind of maybe their um, their lead-in to, like, 90s inserts. This is the one that kind of catches their eye because of the, you know, iconic branding. And, again, to me, that just kind of speaks 90s again. Like, given all that, the hip-hop culture, the typography, and the, the advertising and stuff that was done in the 90s, those, you know, uh, Saturday morning cartoons, that kind of like vibe to it. But the branding in the 90s was so spot on. And this has a really interesting story behind this card too, is this card was released and then they had a, um, uh, Skybox actually uh, had a, a cease and desist letter um, for, for using this, but all the cards had already been put on shelves. So there's really nothing that could be done at the time. But I always think it's kind of a cool little anecdotal thing to add on top. But yeah, these are like full acetate cards not really as rare as some people think they're like one in 72 packs. Um, but I mean, they're, they're just, they're, they're great cards. If you're looking for a nineties insert, it's probably one of the most coveted from people who are just looking for something to really scratch that itch. Yeah. I love the, love the pop culture tie into like, you know, just tying to something that people recognize anyway. And then now it's in the car. It's just so cool. Yeah. All right. What are these next two here? Yeah. So this is from uh, the season's best set. I believe this is, 90, 96, 97, or sorry, 90, um, 96, 95, 96. 
This is a Sticky Fingers Jordan. So in the in the Tops uh, Seasons Best set, there was all these subsets, and this one is is called Sticky Fingers. And this has to do with you know defensive maneuverability and defensive tactics. And um, I don't know. I just kind of I wasn't really sure what I was going to do for this one at first. Some I kind of really just kind of try to blend the card with the background. Other ones like these two here, it just makes sense to kind of just like you know put it on put on a show for it and make it like the the creme de la creme of the picture. Like uh, I couldn't help myself with the with the sticky fingers on on the left. Put some honey in there. I added some honey on like his fingers, kind of like dripping off. Oh, I thought that was um, the card design. I haven't seen that card enough to know that. I was gonna say that's a unique touch on that one. I didn't notice that. <laughs> yeah, it's actually me. I, I I put that in there. It's not on the card, but um, but yeah, I I just think. I don't know. Try to try to tie in like the the theme of the card, sticky fingers. What do you think of? And uh, you know, just kind of work with it and play with it. Awesome. What about the next one here? Uh, yeah, this is another one. So this kind of goes, in my opinion, at least from you know perspective of people who are looking to kind of get into like '90s insert related stuff. It's kind of the Duncan Gonus and That's Jam. Those are kind of the two that they see first. And this is kind of just like the Welch's Jam jars and. Uh, People see, I mean, people always, the pushback people always give with this one is Kobe has like raspberry jam, but there are, there are grape jam in this set. Like, oh, it should have been great because he, you know, Laker is purple and that kind of thing. And I, I can see that, but I really do like the like the fluorescent um, red that, that pops off this, but it's a great card, super fun to work with. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely, definitely glad to have a Kobe in my, in my collection, but um, there, there's a ton of other, other players in this set that you can probably grab for, you know, you know 15 to, to 50 bucks yeah one of the fun things there where you can get the other players still enjoy the card before you make that you know full investment on the really expensive one that you probably want the most i don't know i always feel like i drift towards that sometimes with new sets 100 percent, and that, that's kind of why where my some of the, the plumber collecting that came in like let me, let me dabble here some of the stuff's a little more affordable so i'll play here and then i'll, I'll see if i want to go any any more deeper awesome and the last two here these are both super unique so this will be really cool to hear about yeah, so I'm, I'm like a 90s guy, like through and through, but a lot of that, maybe because I'm a bit younger, but some of that bleeds into the early 2000s. I think some of the most underrated years of cards are probably like, um, you know, you always hear 97, 98, 98, 99. Um, and then it kind of just like goes down as you get more towards the 2000s. 99, 2000 is probably one of my favorite years. Um, and this is uh, Topps Galleries, 99, 2000. So the one on the right, the, the Kobe. Uh, this is Gallery of Heroes. Um, and so these were just like some of the more, some of the original like stained glass cards. Uh, there were actually a few before this, I think in some baseball sets, but um, as far as basketball, I'm pretty sure this is one of the first, uh, but it just has that, you know, that crinkled glass look, full transparency, not full, tra translucent, um, light passes through. And for this one, I kind of gave it like that, um, that church stained glass window scene. And uh, I don't know. It just worked. It just worked really well. I uh, I don't know something about the these stained glass, especially when you kind of put it in like that church. It just seems like more more important, more reverent. You know, it's just a really good uh, um, environment for that card. Yeah, so cool. I'd have to ask too, and no need to share any details that you can't. But um, what's the logistics behind doing this? Are you just really good with like Photoshop or something? And again, don't share anything that would give away your secret. But I'm just curious there for somebody who doesn't know art super well. Yeah, I mean, I use some. Some are relatively easy. If you go back to some of my earlier stuff, it's literally just making like a very simple background and kind of putting the card on top. Maybe just blending out some things. Um, so you know, I use I use Photoshop. I use other other kind of similar tools. But it's really just that. I mean, some some designs I can do relatively quickly. Other ones take, you know, I'll kind of work on it for a day, come back to it, and kind of play with it over time. But it's really more just it's, 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 it's Photoshop ish stuff. That's really all it is. Yeah, I'm excited to see you start a consulting where we have our Grail cards, and you can make a design that we can blow up on a canvas on our wall or something, or like frame the card in it. Yeah, I don't want to hear your million dollar business idea, but like that just sounds awesome to me. <laughs> I know. I would love to get some of these, and I've actually been talking to trying to get some of these blown up like you know like a like a three foot by three foot yeah. you know canvas or something like that um so hopefully maybe we'll get there someday awesome looking forward to seeing it all right and then finally the the you know we did the mount rushmore of your designs now we'll do the mount rushmore of your collection with the cards by themselves obviously as a staple of the show um for anyone watching we do a mount rushmore with every collector so I'd love to hear if you could touch on the cards here and what you know what you like about them that you view as these are like 
you know, to me, my top four cards that I would, you know, pick over any of my others. So I'd love to hear about these ones here. Yeah, this exercise was way harder than I thought it was going to be. I, I almost need to do like like four different Mount Rushmores to kind of <laughs> encapsulate all parts. But he, it's, this is a good a good sampling of, of some of the stuff that I think represents uh, my collection well. So it's funny. I think I, listen, I was listening to the episode with Sal, and I think he had the he had the, the same one. Um, you know, the ninety seven ninety eight uh, finest embossed um, refractor uh, number to seventy four. Uh, again, this fits into that niche that's like perfect for me as far as the layering. I mean, you have you have die cut, you have the hyperplat atomic refractor foiling, um, you have the embossing number to seventy four. I mean, so it has really everything. Like like the hierarchy of things for me, or at least the things that I look for in cards, something that's interesting, significant, rare, scarce, aesthetically pleasing, and then like layered. That's kind of the stuff. I, so a lot of these cards, that, at least in the Mount Rushmore here, will kind of show those thematic things. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of started this set. 97 Finest is, is, is one of my favorite sets of all time. And it's actually more complicated than most people think. Like if you are coming from the outside, you kind of maybe have seen this card. There's a few other, um, there's there's three levels to the, to the set or the, the product. So there's like the bronze level, which is the, the the common. Then there's the silver, which is the uncommon and the gold, which is rare. And then each of those have like layered differences between um, some of the pieces. So for example, there, there's 10 total Kobe cards in this 97, 98 set. There's a bronze card and there's a bronze refractor. There's four silver cards. So one's like the silver um, base, one's like the silver embossed, the silver refractor at a 1090. And then you have the silver um, embossed refractor out of a 263. And the gold works pretty similarly. You have the gold, you have the gold embossed, which is also die cut. Then you have the gold refractor, number to 289. And then the gold embossed uh, refractor, which is number to 74, the one you see here. Um, but it's just like, you know, sometimes it, you see an image on a card, and you're like, oh, I know that card. But when sets like this, there are like multiple levels of each card. It's, it's like the flare showcase and gold label sometimes. It's like, Oh, I think I have that card, but you mistake like one of the rows or or one of the classes for a different card. You're like, oh, I thought I had that one, or you've researched it so much that you think you have that card, but you don't. You know, um, have you even seen I, it with PMGs where you're talking to somebody? Oh, I had that one as a kid, and you're like, oh, yeah, it was a different color. Yeah. Are you sure. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, it, it's just probably one of my favorite sets. I think overall the the combination of all those technologies into a final product, it just creates something that's, I, I don't know how you feel, but sometimes when I look at that cards, I just can't even believe that like I'm, I'm uh, looking at pieces of cardboard the way I'm looking at them. You yeah. know what I mean? It's just like, it has all these features coming. They feel like there's something like much bigger than just a piece of cardboard. And I guess yeah. they are, but, um, but yeah, th this set the is kind of like the, um, yeah, I don't know, just the legacy. Like you just feel like you're holding the legacy in your hands. Like it's just so interesting. Yeah. This set is like the perfect, like cross section of, of stuff that I like. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome card. Yeah. I love this one. I, again, I talked to, like you said, Sal had mentioned this with the Kobe, which he pulled, which is just crazy, but I know uh, I can't, cool, I can't cool imagine it that. again. No, no kidding. Awesome. What's the second card here? Yo, so this is the 99, 2000, um, FLIR focus. Uh, source subjects and this is the vivid parallel so there's a, a base card or a base insert of this card um there's no hollow foil it's just foil um and that's pretty much it still still a cool card great image kind of cool background um the vivid versions they're numbered to 50 so this is this is number to 50 um over the the kobe um nameplate and over that little vivid symbol up in the top left there's like a gold shimmery foil on there. That's not on, on the base insert version. And the whole back is just full hollow foil. Um, and th these are probably honestly, some of the most aesthetically pleasing cards I've seen. Um, I, I haven't had one of these for a while and this is more of like a probably past year pickup, but it's, they're, they're great. Like they are unbelievable cards. And, uh, I, again, it kind of gets shoved into like that latter end of the nineties and that, that blend over here from the nineties to the two thousands. So they kind of get, you know, maybe not as much love as some of the, the heavy hitters, like the Ruby's credentials and PMGs, but I, I think they're just excellent cards. 
Awesome. And then the third one here we talked about a little bit, but I'd love to hear what, again, makes you view this one as a Mount Rushmore piece here for you. Yeah. So again, like I said, I, I like cards that are a little bit, um, you know, this is definitely on the path for collectors who like Kobe and, and it's definitely something they're aware of. But a lot of like true and true 90s collectors who just do 90s, this might fall outside of the, off the beaten path a little bit. This is strong 2004, 2005, which is definitely extending my range of, of where I collect a bit. But um, this card was just too too pretty to, to pass up. Um, so it kind of, a lot of the design elements on this one really give nod to a lot of the 90s sets, like the 96 Flare Showcase Hot Shots or the in baseball, the 97 um, Hot Gloves Flare Showcase. It kind of, with like the fire die cut card, it kind of alludes to those sets. Um, but yeah, full front um, hollow foil. And what happened with these, these are actually, again, there, there's no serial numbering on these. I think that happens a lot with certain sets. You have sets that aren't serial numbered. And because of that, they kind of get disregarded um, or, or they're not as sought after. Um, but these, I think um, Card Channel does a good job at some of the stuff uh, as far as like pack odds. And I think these are the estimated print runs somewhere in like the 75 um, ballpark. Um, so not, not an impossible find, but definitely one that's uh, a little a little harder to track down. Is LeBron in this set? I'm sure, right? But I yes, I LeBron is in this cool. set. Awesome. I still always I always think it's cool when you could have you know you got the Shaq, you got the Kobe, you can go after you know just all these these really just strong eras. They just have so many players, man, in these inserts. It's just so cool. I know. I, I I get sucked into some of the set stuff sometimes because like I'll have like okay, cool, I got the one for my PC. Then one will I'll see one at a show or one will pop up online like cheap. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Now I got two. And you kind of feel like the like the the pull to start the set just gets like stronger and stronger. Like, should I do it? Should I not? And uh, the whole back and forth in your head of like, is this? Am I detracting from the funds I should be using for my main PC? Am I putting too much into the set side now? You know, it, it's just a um, can be very you know engaging sometimes when you, when you have multiple pieces together. Um, like here's a fun anecdotal story. There was actually a, a, a random '90s player, baseball, who I don't collect. But I, I remember the player pretty fondly. And one night there was some consigner who literally listed like 15 of this player's cards on on a, on at auction. They ended in like a week. And I don't collect this player. I, I but I, I, remember, I remember liking the player. And it wasn't like a, a huge, huge name. But for some reason, I was like, oh, wow, I could almost like just get all these and assemble these and have like a great collection of this player. And so there's there's something to be said about and I don't know what that is like in the collector mindset of just wanting to put like pieces together and get them in under one household or, or one grouping. And um, I don't know that that poll can be pretty strong sometimes. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't even know how to describe it. I know exactly I know exactly what you're talking about, but I have no idea how to actually describe that. It's just like putting pieces of the puzzle together that also overlap in different ways that make sense to you, maybe not to everybody. Yeah. You know, there's just this weird like. I think it's obviously a collector thing across multiple hobbies. I'm sure it's not even just sports, but it's interesting there. What was the what was the the backstory behind the set collecting for you on the select gold set? Yeah, so um, I'd say interest came in because I was looking for I wanted to do set collecting number one because I'd done player collecting like I talked about already, um, and I felt like I got everything I wanted for Peyton Manning that wasn't like you know uh, cutting off an arm for especially look at the, some of the '90s stuff, right? Right. Um, and so then I was looking for I started looking I was like. I guess number one, I wanted to find a set that is um, historically important because it drives something. Like I wanted a first year product of something. I think that's just important to me. I just think to me, that's always really cool because those will be sets that, um, you know, I'm seeing other people collect and it's something where it's probably hard to pursue, but to be able to put it together like 20 years from now, I'll be able to say, yeah, I have the first year, the whole year for that, right? Like 2012 Prism, I don't think it's even possible at this point for like basketball, you know, and that sort of oh, stuff. Yeah. I mean, unless you're a millionaire, right? Um, yeah. And then- I'd say the main part of it though, was I, I realized that, you know, again, my peak football watching, I was just thinking through, it's like, now I was in middle school, high school and like what, you know, 2010 to 2016 or something. It's like, that's when I watched the most football and that select set has, you know, three players from every team that are active. So it's like, I know every single name in the set. And that was really cool to me, right? It has like Arian Foster, you know, like cult heroes like that. But then also you have Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, Plus, at the end of the set, you have 50 retired players, which is unique. It's a lot of their first Prism Golds, and I am never going to get into like anything beyond like 2014, 2015. So it was like a cool way to kind of get this 
weird connection to a Barry Sanders card that I never would have thought to collect, but now I have because mm. it fits my set. I never yeah. liked those playing years, but it just fits perfect. I don't know. It's just like kind of to what we were just getting at. It just hit all the boxes and it just dropped in my face of like, this is the one, you know, go for this one. And yeah, it's been fun ever since. I don't know about you with your like set collecting journeys, but I'm like almost more excited for, you know, the journey than even completing. Cause a lot of people are like, go sure. get this one, go do that. And it's like, it's a great idea. But when I finish what's next, like, I just love the being on the path versus the actual completion. Plus, I don't know how the hell I'm going to display it. And we need a nicer home. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not storing anything in this old house. I don't want a fire to burn everything down. But yeah, um, no, yeah, yeah. yeah. So a little long winded, but it's maybe gives you some um, knowledge there on that. No, I, I think you're, I think you're right. It's, it's some like when I've historically done like set collections, it's always been like a set almost makes itself apparent. You know, things start to line up. It's like, oh, well, I really like these players. I really like this design. Um, you know, I, 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 yeah, it kind of just coalesces around this idea that this is this is the right one. And I've always that's how I've always kind of approached my collecting is I kind of have like main primary player PCs, but then I always like to have like I don't know like one set or two sets maybe that I kind of maybe they're rare or maybe they're like semi rare or just underrated in my opinion, and I'll just kind of pick away at them to kind of um, I don't know scratch, fill in scratch the, the itch or something. <laughs> yeah, it's kind, of, kind of scratch the itch, fill in the gaps. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but it's also like that's like the that's like the history of collecting too is like trying to do some of these sets to some degree. I'm not telling it's anybody exactly, how to collect, yeah. but like um like I remember when like I would go to uh there's this whole like movement now of like doing things like efficiently and having things like that day or being able to or making online marketplaces the most efficient. Um, at getting cards between buyers and sellers. And I, I get that to a degree, but at the same time, it's like, this is like a, this is a hobby. This is a pastime. I want to spend time doing this. You know what I mean? I want to spend time yep, yep. in the, the hobby. Journey. And so if I, yep. if I, you know, skirt that path by just getting everything as quickly as I can, it's like, it kind of defeats the purpose of spending time on doing something I like. Um, oh no. Yeah. No, totally there. Right. Like, um, also funny, I didn't even mention aesthetics. I'm talking to the guy who's obsessed with art and I didn't even talk about aesthetics with my set, which is just funny, but it tells you how many, how many <laughs> reasons I like it. Um, but yeah, no, I totally agree with you, right? Because I could go, I know today I could go buy three guys I need on eBay right now, but I'd be paying probably two times what I want. It just doesn't feel right. It feels like cheating. I don't know how yeah. to explain that because I, I know my budget's not infinite. So if I go and act like it, um, not only am I overextending, but I'm also kind of not trusting the process of the cards will come, just wait for it, you know, like that sort of yeah. thing. So. Um, and like there, there are some there are some base sets that I've always wanted to collect, like the '97 Metal Universe, '97 Metal Universe Championship. Just wanted to do those complete sets, and I could go online right now and buy every single card in those sets. So I, I didn't want to do that though. It's like, why am I doing that? So I made it like a goal. Hey, I'm going to do these sets, but I have to pick them up at shows in dollar boxes. Yep. Like that's the thing. Just so even if I don't find like a major PC card at a show, it's like okay, well I'll just dig around and find some of these cards to fill some of the sets in. Yeah, that is a fun way to think about it, especially in stuff that's not limited where you like you said you can just find it immediately. Right. It gives a gives a chase a reason to be looking at shows, that's for sure. So Exactly. Exactly. That was a fun uh, fun diatribe there. I appreciate the question. <laughs> yeah. So what's the what's the fourth card here that you want to wrap up with? And it's funny yeah. you said, sorry, but I was just going to say I must need to curate my Instagram better because I swear I don't get enough basketball because I see this set all the time for football, all the time for baseball and I never see it for basketball. I have no idea why, but anyways, yeah, probably because I mean it's definitely one of the sought after sets, but it, it, it's it's rare and it's Jordan's not in the set. That, that's a big you know um, call it a fallback if you want to, but it's really just because sets that have Jordan tend to if Jordan was in this set. I mean that would be a ridiculous card. Oh yeah, um, but, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, you, that'd be you, competing you, with some of those PMGs. I bet I guarantee. Oh, of course, it, of course it would 100%. be. But yeah. Um, so, you know, this is a set that's kind of nice because it kind of flows nicely across the, the three sports, baseball, football, and basketball. Uh, the Flair Brilliance 24 carry. Um, I actually had an interesting story with this card. There was one that was up on eBay earlier, um, and uh, I didn't grab it. It was I think it was too high of like a buy it now price, and I was like, uh, you know, it's Carrie Kittle, so no one's going to, you know, grab it. From, you know what I mean? And then like – I was like, so I have some time to gather some funds and I'll go get it. And then about a week later, it was just gone. Like best offer except I was like, oh my gosh. Like, and I was like, this is after coming off of like a, a period I had spent of kind of like listing out and saying, okay, what cards do I want to get for certain players? And I was like, man, 
This car's only number 24. It's come up that often. And I've only seen like three public sales of this card ever. And so, and I, one was like from years ago, one was this one I just missed. And then luckily about a month later, another one popped up like just after I was kicking myself for not getting the other one. So I was able to, to track that one down and get it, but these are just great in hand. The Kobe's probably you no know, out of reach, um, but like it's um, full gold foil refractor front finish, the little gold 24 karat in the top. Apparently I think it's from manufacturer. They actually show it in some of the um, promotional material that there's actually small gold piece up there as well in the 24 karat uh, part. Uh, but these, these are just great. They're just great cards. Limited print run scarcity. Again, it's interesting, significant, rare, scarce, aesthetic, and you know, layered. That's, that's what I like. Checks all the boxes. Yeah. And it hits a player you like, obviously. I know I see your bio has Carrie Kittles in there. Where'd that come from? Yeah, we didn't really get into Carrie Kittles too much. Oh. Um, so Carrie Kittles was kind of like, um, I was looking for another player collection. So I was always a Kobe collector, uh, but I was wanted something else. Um, maybe as a way to get into certain cards who I couldn't scratch the itch for in, in Kobe. So it was kind of like this side card to my main PC. Um, so I started collecting Kittles probably about four or five years ago. And um, it's been it's been great just to allow me to get into certain pieces or find certain things um, that I wouldn't really have otherwise. So um, and then Kittles um, as a player, I liked him because it was class of 96. So Kobe Iverson, Marbury, Ray Allen, Jermaine O'Neal, that whole, the whole class. I love, that's my favorite class of all time, class of 96. He's from that class. Um, he also coached at, uh, I'm originally from New Jersey. Um, he coached at Princeton for a while. My brother went to Princeton. It was always the different connections of that kind of overlay. Like, okay, this makes sense. Kind of the same way that the, the set collecting coalesces. It's like, okay, yeah, th this player makes sense to collect for me. Awesome. No, it totally makes sense. Dude, this has been super, super fun. Um, last week I didn't do a fast five and people were complaining, but again, I had a, couldn't do it. <laughs> we got to do it today. We have to. No, I, I heard you were, were all filled up on a, like what whiskey and cheese curds. Well, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I said old fashions and then I'm sure everyone who's not from Wisconsin thinks this guy's an alcoholic, but it's uh, it's a very different thing here. <laughs> you just go out to eat on Friday, get a fish fry, you get a couple drinks. I mean, it's just just so typical, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was funny after I said that, but, um, yeah, so fast five. So I have a few questions that I think would be really fun to talk about. So, um, hopefully, you know, fairly easy, but also probably some of these are gonna be tough. Um, first one I wrote down here is, um, if you could only have one physical, you know, I don't want to say, I don't know if the words like attribute, right. These like care, these traits of cards, we talked about multiple different ones on here, like die cuts, you know, um, see, uh, acetate, I was gonna say see through acetate. Um, if you could only pick one physical, attribute and you had to collect that as like a side pc what would you go for and again you know more about these attributes than i do maybe there's one i'm not even thinking of but is there anything that comes to mind there um i think i think a common answer would be um refractor or atomic refractor hyperplaid finish i think that'd be common i think the one that i would probably go after is uh lenticular finishes mm -hmm. i think you'll probably get it at you know i think it's kind of flies under the radar a little bit. Some people don't like it. I really like it. It also tends to be associated with parallels that are pretty rare. Um, so that's another reason why I would probably pursue it. But I, I do like lenticular. I do pick up a lot of lenticular stuff just because I think it's cool. You know, a lot of promotional stuff for other companies and, and advertisements during this period was also done on lenticular stock for like 3D effects. So I'd probably go with that. With that. Okay, awesome. A next question. Um, a wizard gives you a card that says, give us $10. You can have any card in the world. What card are you taking? Kind of akin to write the create your own card, but not as unique there, but <laughs> yeah, any card I would probably have to go with. It's in somebody else's PC, but I'd probably have to go with the, uh, 98, 99 Kobe gem master. What's it? What's the design look like on that one? I've been seeing some football ones lately. They're crazy, but I wasn't sure if basketball is the same. Yeah, it's exactly the same. Exactly the same finish. Uh, it's, in, it's in Spinatron's collection. So how do you even describe it? It's like, uh, to me, it's like just I just think like volcanic, volcanic rock or something. Like, I don't even know how to explain it. It's just like yeah, it's almost like, it's almost like a silver, like metallic effect of like the the ninety eight rubies. If you're, mm -hmm. people are familiar with that effect, like the, it's, it's gold, but it's kind of like that same like. Um, almost like small little leaflets that kind of like intersect down. But um, yeah, that, that, that's such an amazing card. I think people, I think a lot of people who are after 
to pick one card, would probably go with a from the nineties. Would go with a one of one. If you're picking a one of one from the nineties, chances are you'd probably pick. It's probably the Gem Masters is probably one of the top ones you would choose. The second one I would probably choose if I had to was the um, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, the one of one Extreme Apex, hmm. Apex Extreme. So that that's from uh, the 99, 2000, I believe. And that has one of the most ridiculous backgrounds on any card. It's kind of, kind of akin to like the 97, 98 rubies a little bit. Mm -hmm. Think of that, but like smaller bubbles and a little bit more, um, a little bit more nuanced. Awesome. Awesome. And then uh, third card or third card here. Third question here is, um, let's say somebody's coming into the nineties here. I asked like Sal kind of this last week. Um, what would you be your recommendation to get started? Not not more from a budget side, but more of like gathering knowledge. Like, let's just say you the person had to dive in, start buying some cards. What's the best way to learn? And maybe you already kind of touched on that with you know focusing on one player. Is that what you'd recommend there? Is there or is there a different yeah. tip there for that? Um, yeah, I, I definitely would remit, um, recommend player collecting somebody. So find somebody who probably isn't the most expensive that you liked from the '90s, who you can kind of get a sense for what the sets are, what the products are, all this stuff. There's a lot of cool products that are only like one year products in the late nineties that have some cool, um, some cool cards to collect. So I would pick one player, kind of get a, a sampling of, of the stuff that you like from the different years. And then if you want to change to a different player, fine. But I think picking one player, I think it's going to give you the best um, foray into what's available. And then from there, and maybe I would do that plus collect one set. Mm -hmm. I would, you know, just to kind of keep the gears churning. I also, the, the research side of the hobby is like people think that, you know, the only two parts of the hobby are buying and selling cards from like an activity perspective. You know, this is great. What could be art for me has actually allowed another lane. Okay. It's like, fine. I can't, I'm not buying and selling right now, but I'm going to just work with some of these cards. I'm going to go deep into the 97, 98 um, metal universe set and just do art with those cards. Um, so I think finding other ways to enjoy the cards and then also just, just research. For me, I, I find the research part. So to go on Instagram, go into some of these uh, card forums and stuff and just kind of go down the rabbit trail and find interesting sets. Oh, I kind of like that, how it looks, what products is it from, what other cards are in that product. And just kind of like tug at that and go. I mean, I, there were days when I was getting back into it back in like 2016 where I would spend like hours just like, oh, that's a cool card. And I would just like, daisy chain from one thing to the next until i feel like i had okay i kind of understand this set or i kind of understand this this year um that's how you got to do it in my, in my opinion no it totally makes sense appreciate the tip there uh some fourth question any any other hobbies or fun things about yourself that would be cool to share with the audience anything you enjoy doing um yeah i enjoy uh fishing i enjoy um brewing i brewed beer for like 15 years so um yeah if you want to talk beers and cars, uh, cards, I'm, I'm, I'm down. So, um, I haven't, I haven't been to the national in Chicago yet. I was, I was, went to the one in AC, but I haven't been out to Chicago. So, um, it'd be great to, you know, catch up with some people who I've met over the, the years and grab some beers, talk cards. So that, that those two things are probably my, my biggest hobbies right now are cards and, and beer. <laughs> great, great, uh, great connection there. The good, good two to do together. Um, fifth one, final question here is, what are your most exciting plans this weekend? We have a, you know, a three day weekend coming up. Is there anything fun you're doing card wise or just, you know, hanging out with family and stuff like that? Uh, this weekend, honestly, I'm trying to do nothing. I'm trying to just sit somewhere and do nothing. Um, my life's been all over the place. So, um, but you know, in a couple of weeks there are, there are some um, local shows, uh, popping up in somewhat in the area. So maybe I'll take a drive. Um, I've been doing that a lot recently, you know, just checking out like small towns, around where I live, checking it out with my wife and then we'll go there and then we'll maybe pop over the card show or something like that. But, um, probably something like that. It's my favorite time of year and end of summer kind of yeah. going into like the fall. It's like the best weather in my opinion. So it's a good time. Awesome. Well, thanks Greg. Honestly, one of my favorite episodes ever. And I don't just say that, that was super fun topic. I don't know a ton about, so that's where I think it adds enjoyment and hopefully everyone else enjoyed this one as much as I did. Um, where can people find you on Instagram if they have any questions or if they just want to follow an awesome page? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm Greg at cardboard insights. Um, yeah, shoot me a follow feel free to message me about anything. Um, uh, I should have some, hopefully maybe I'll use this as a, as a platform to decide if I should jump into some, some baseball and football stuff yeah. as well on the design side. So 
Yeah, I'll put out a poll or something in a week, and, and we'll see if uh, people like that or not. Yeah. Well, hopefully, yeah, if it's after this episode, the football crowd, hopefully we'll give it some give it some upvotes. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> we'll see. But yeah, if you ever want to collab or anything too, just let me know. Happy to, that'd be super fun. Yeah, I appreciate it, Austin. Thank you so much. Really do yeah, appreciate thanks it. again, Greg. That was awesome. Thanks. Yeah, we'll see you. Bye.